Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, uh, dear friends, and good afternoon to everybody. It is indeed a great pleasure for me to warmly welcome you all to this event, which we named Advancing the Culture of Peace. And it is on the occasion of the UN General Assembly's high-level forum on the culture of peace. The meeting um, today across the street is convened by the President of the General <laughs> Assembly, Peter Thompson, who is with us here today. This event here at uh, IPI um, is the result of two important partnerships for the Institute. First, a long-standing partnership with the Office of the President of the General Assembly, and second, a new partnership with the uh, al Baptain Cultural Foundation. And we thank them both for their commitment and their leadership in the pursuit of a more peaceful world. Everyone agrees that an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. But recently, the question around how best to prevent conflict have changed instead of asking what causes war and how can we fight it, people are asking what makes a peaceful society and how can we build and how can we sustain it. In order to answer these questions, it is necessary to explore connections between culture, peace, security and development. And one idea which unites all of these elements is the concept of culture for peace, which is, of course, our topic today. We have an excellent panel to discuss these matters, but before we turn to the panel, we will have opening remarks from our esteemed partners. Peter Thompson, as you all know, is the president of the 71st session of the General Assembly, and he is also the former permanent representative of Fiji to the United Nations. Peter has been, and indeed is, a living legend at the UN. I remember well when I started at the UN, actually way back in 1994, after my first meeting with then UN Secretary General Boutros Ghali, as I was leaving his office, he called me back and he said, you should be aware of one thing. It is not only the big powers that have influence at the United Nations. Sometimes it's the smallest nations that have the most skillful ambassadors. They can be much more influential, he said, than the big nations. And through his tenure at the UN, Peter has been an outstanding example of exactly this. Abdulaziz Saud al Baptain is a distinguished man of letters and business and chairman of the al Baptain Cultural Foundation, which he founded in 1989. He has, through his extremely successful career, been a champion of peace. His devotions and activities for culture and peace reminds me of another episode with another Secretary General at the UN, namely Kofi Annan. Um, once he asked me to draft a speech for him, and after having read the draft, he told me to rewrite it from A to Z. I was a bit disappointed, but also slightly puzzled, and I asked me why he wanted these fundamental changes. He said that my draft didn't speak to the hearts. What Mr. Abbaptain has done so exemplary throughout his career, through poetry, is to speak to the hearts and not only to the minds. And that's much more effective in our quest for peace. So we now look forward to hearing from you both. And at this stage, I will thank you for your kind attention. So first, Mr. Thompson, you have the floor. But let me also tell you before I ask you to come uh, uh, to the podium that Mr. Abdel will be speaking in Arabic 
for his remarks and there will be a simultaneous translation. Channel 1 is for English and Channel 2 is for Arabic. So, Peter, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, look, uh, to be introduced by a living legend, as a living legend, uh, you know, I just, I'm sorry, I, I, I can't accept it in my case, but uh, in Taya's case, as you well know, go down and uh, see the play. <laughs> um, and you'll know uh, what uh, a legend, being a legend really means. So thank you very much for that introduction. I guess I'd rather be a living legend than a dead one, but <laughs> that's coming in due time. Um, it, we've uh, had a very good start to the uh, meeting today and I want to congratulate the uh, Ambassador and Permanent Representative of Bangladesh for the great work that his mission did in putting all that together and uh, we've got a busy afternoon ahead of us as well. So uh, to uh, the President of IPI, uh, Ambassador Larson, and to my new friend, uh, Mr. Abdul Aziz al Um We've just had a meeting over in my office, and excellencies and ladies and gentlemen. When world leaders came together in June 1945 to establish the United Nations, as you well know, they pledged us all to a common purpose, which was to save succeeding generations from the scourge of war. Over the second decades that have followed, as global dynamics and weapons of war and threats to peace and security have evolved, the United Nations has grappled on how best to achieve its founding charter pledge. Around 50 years in, during the mid-1990s, the United Nations began to adopt a series of resolutions on the culture of peace, which promoted an interdisciplinary approach to achieving lasting peace. Many of the culture of peace foundational resolutions recognized the fundamental link between peace development and human rights and spelt out how education, science, and communication could be used to promote democracy and dialogue and reconciliation and solidarity. Indeed, when the Program of Action on the Climate of Peace was adopted in 1999, this articulation went further still, with detailed provisions setting out how actions taken through education, economic and social development, human rights, gender equality, democratic participation, understanding and tolerance, and the free flow of information and international peace and security could serve to build a culture of peace. While these agreements point to a long-standing recognition within the international community that building sustainable peace requires comprehensive approaches that bridge peace and security and human rights and sustainable development, it has only been in recent times that concerted efforts have been made to embed this mindset and this operational approach into the work of the United Nations. In April last year, faced with an increasingly complex global security environment and a history of mixed success in United Nations peace and security engagements, the General Assembly and the Security Council decided to advance a new approach to peace. In a welcome demonstration of bicameral cooperation, both chambers adopted the Sustaining Peace Resolutions, thereby committing to a comprehensive new approach to the maintenance of international peace and security. Of course, these resolutions were not agreed in a vacuum. Just seven months earlier, world leaders had adopted the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, setting forth a universal master plan for peace, planet, and prosperity. Central to the 2030 Sustainable Development Agenda was the fundamental recognition of the importance of peaceful, just, and inclusive societies in the creation of an enabling environment for sustainable development. Similarly, central to the Sustaining Peace Resolutions was the recognition of peace as both an enabler and an outcome of sustainable development. So, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, as global attention increasingly shifts to implementation of the 2030 Sustainable Development Agenda, and with sustainable development and sustaining peace essentially serving as two agendas that stand or fall together, 
it is clear we must do all we can to create an environment for their success. This includes by cultivating a culture of peace in support of our implementation efforts. In many ways, this message was the defining one to emerge during the high-level SDG action event that I convened in January this year at the United Nations on building sustainable peace for all. During this January event, speakers affirmed that there can be no sustainable development without sustaining peace, and there can be no sustaining of peace without sustainable development. That was the mantra. And they highlighted the importance of inclusivity to these efforts, of building social cohesion, including through interfaith dialogue, of capturing the vital contributions of women and youth and minorities in peace and the development process, and of ensuring that no one is left behind. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, the international community has never before faced a direct challenge as big as implementing the 2030 Sustainable Development Agenda, the Sustaining Peace Resolutions, and the Paris Climate Agreement. We can meet this challenge, uh, I, uh, no doubt about that. We have the resources and we have the ingenuity to do so. But we take it on with one hand tied behind our back if we fail to give sufficient attention to simultaneously building a culture of peace across our world. These are the tasks at hand, promoting understanding of our common humanity, strengthening intercultural and interreligious dialogue and understanding, teaching the values of equality, tolerance and respect, and inspiring people's hopes for a future in which we all unite for peace. It is thus that we must prioritize building a culture of peace as part of our integrated approach to promoting peace, sustainable development, and human rights across the world. And I thank you for your attention. Mr. President of the Assem uh, General Assembly of the United Nations, Mr. President of the International Peace Institute, uh, Terry Rod Larson, Distinguished representatives of member states, honorable ambassador and heads of diplomatic missions, say that, uh, ladies and gentlemen, it is a great honor for me wa and for the Ablaziz Saud Bakhtain Cultural Foundation to be amongst you today. And this meeting today is the fruit of our sincere will uh, to cooperate uh, constructively. This is reflected by our work team and the working team of the IPI and the working team of the General Assembly of the UN. I am sure we can develop this tripartite cooperation and a joint interactive action into a larger scale and and these activities will include governmental institutions and NGOs and this in order to promote a culture of peace and dedicate a specific dialogue continuously and this is what we envision um, doing, supported by His Highness Amir Sheikh Sabah Al Ahmed Al Jabra Sabah, the Amir of Kuwait. This high level forum on the culture of peace, which is specifically concerned with the development and support of a culture of peace, has been at the heart of the work programs of our institution. For more than uh, more, more two decades, we have dedicated our efforts and activities uh, to two related topics that are the dialogue between cultures based on understanding and respect and justice, development of culture of peace according to clear programs of work and mechanisms of actions in order to reach practical solutions to achieve the ultimate goal of making peace that is sustainable amongst the people. Ladies and gentlemen, 
I firmly believe that sound thinking about peace is based on specific rules. Most important amongst them, first, peace is based on mutual respect. Second, the I and justice. Second, that the origin of peace is our consensus around it. Third, is it's a historical need. Fourth, it is a continuous course that we must not stop. First, fifth, peace is above all based on education. This last rule is the foundation of all uh, our programs with our partners, especially the IPI. The, together we prepared a plan and different activities covering different countries uh, until 2020. There is no doubt that we seek to guarantee uh, the uh, guarantee existence, protect humanity and noble values and virtues, and organize relations based on love, understanding, and tolerance. And our goal is to have peace and with values like respect, tolerance, honesty, synergy, uh, the sense of duty, freedom, justice, that is part of our daily behavior and tradition. Let us make our culture a vector of peace. And one of its indication is uh, the culture. So this culture of peace turns us into creatures of peace. This is what humanity needs. Ladies and gentlemen, it is a crucial moment that we think into mechanisms and programs and implement them to the degree to each could do. Surely, we will face problems and obstacles but the most important is to get positive results as our initiatives are founding on, uh, founded on. The, the right to peace is a right for all humankind. This is the universal right to all human rights. And to whomever wants to know this universal right, we will not know it by the names of those acting for it. Letter, it might be indicated, but it is always uh, by teaching it. That's how we can embody it in life, by every breath, by every word, when every behavior, and even in our mindsets. Uh, Mr. President of the General Assembly, uh, Mr. Peter Thompson, President of the International Peace Institute, Terry Rod Larson, ladies and gentlemen, we are all beings of peace and love. And I commit uh, to you all that through the foundation and in cooperation of all our partners and our uh, the philanthropists we work with, to sustain and support peace. This is really the core of the project that I will present this afternoon at the General Assembly at the UN. Thank you for your attention, and may God blessings be upon you. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, uh, Dr. Alba uh Welcome, everybody. Thank you, uh, Terry and Mr. Thompson. Uh, for getting us off to a great start. Uh, I know uh, uh, time is tight, a busy agenda across the street. Um, one of the, the goals of IPI uh, is to draw uh, connections among the various strands of UN work um, and within the multilateral system more broadly. And this uh, side event um, on the occasion of the High Level Forum on the Culture of Peace uh, provides an opportunity just uh, to do that among uh, the concept of the culture of peace, uh, sustainable development, uh, and in particular the work of sustaining peace. Um, 
as noted, in order to understand how peaceful societies are sustained, we must explore connections among culture, peace, security, and development. And I think we have a great panel uh, here today to do just that. We, um, we, you have uh, bios in your handout, so I will only introduce them shortly, uh, briefly, and uh, we'll go right to it. Um, some people have to be back uh, across the street in, uh, by uh, 2, or we'll, we'll finish up by 2.35, but I think that should have, uh, give us plenty of time for our discussion. Um, first, we have uh, um, Ambassador Gillian Bird, Permanent Representative of Australia to the United Nations, then Ambassador Masood bin Momen, Permanent Representative of the People's Republic of Bangladesh to the United Nations, and then uh, Assistant Secretary General Oscar Fernandez Taranco for uh, Assistant Secretary General for Peace Building Support. Um, and I think with that, I will turn it straight to uh, Ambassador Bird. Ambassador Bird, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. And um, let me at the outset uh, thank Ambassador Terry Rod Larson and the IPI for the invitation to speak today on this panel. Um, it's a really interesting topic and a very time, timely moment to be looking at it. Um, one of the reasons it's an exciting time to consider this issue is because there is, in my view, real... Thank you. Can you hear me? Um, there is real momentum to reform the UN now in practical ways to improve its capacities in prevention, sustaining peace, and to implement the SDGs. Um, and it's, it's really very interesting and, I think, useful to reflect on how the ideas we committed to in the context of culture of peace, which stretches back to 1997, have been developed and built on over the years. And in many ways, the concerns and the opportunities which motivated our work on the culture of peace show a strong overlap with the concerns and opportunities which motivated our more recent normative work on sustaining peace and the SDGs. And it's due to the links, that those theoretical links between culture of peace, sustaining peace, and the SDGs, as well as the practical work on the culture of peace over the last 20 or so years, that there's a really rich and valuable area for us to explore here. Um, here in New York, we've had intensive, intensive conversations recently about sustaining peace and the SDGs. Um, Australia was very proud to co-facilitate with Angola the sustaining peace resolutions that um, Peter Thompson mentioned, which established ambi ambitious objectives for sustaining peace and prevention. And we're very encouraged by the steps taken to date by the Secretary General, and thank you, Oscar, um, and others in the system, that's Oscar, to ensure that different parts of the UN system work together towards the sustaining peace agenda. Um, this includes the Secretary General's welcome commitment from his vision statement to reinstate prevention at the core of the UN's everyday work. We also have a deep and abiding commitment to the principles of the Declaration on a Culture of Peace. Uh, the Australian government takes Article 5 of that declaration seriously, which says that governments have an essential role in promoting and strengthening a culture of peace. In focusing on how the culture of peace links to the SDGs and sustaining peace, a central question today should be how each can strengthen the other at this key moment. Uh, and despite our recent progress, we must remember that most of the work is still ahead of us if we are going to make prevention, sustaining peace, and implementation of the SDGs a reality. There's a lot to say on what work we still need to do, but I'll focus on two key points. UN coherence and financing. And then I'll come back at the end to some observations about the intersection with the culture of peace. First, on coherence. Much work remains to improve UN coherence. Achieving the ambitions of the Sustaining Peace Agenda and the SDGs must involve new approaches to ensure better coherence in the system, focusing on the primacy of politics. Some critical instances where we need to get this right at this very moment include smooth transitions from the downsizing peacekeeping missions to other configurations of international support. And we need to ensure the development system engages even more closely with questions of peace to tailor approaches and reflect the mutually reinforcing nature of the SDGs. Broader, deeper partnerships for the UN 
and habits of cooperation and coordination are key. Um, in this regard, we're encouraged to see closer cooperation between the UN and the World Bank, although I think more needs to be done. And we look forward to the forthcoming joint report on conflict prevention. Structural adjustments are a necessary part of enabling the UN to deliver on sustaining peace and prevention, but achieving these goals also requires, and it's probably more fundamental, a mind shift, shift a mindset shift within the UN system, a different way of thinking. This includes a shift towards longer term planning, joint analysis, and improved capacity to recognize and seize the sometimes narrow windows for prevention. Secondly, predictable financing. Predictable financing for peace building and conflict prevention has been a central issue of multiple, multiple reviews and resolutions. Without more and better investment, it will be very difficult to move forward. It's essential that the Secretariat produces and then that member states support ambitious options to deliver on the goal of increasing investment in conflict prevention and peace building. And this needs to include options on assessed contributions. We must do more than just rationalize existing peace building resources, which are widely recognized as inadequate and unpredictable. Better cooperation across and outside the UN system is crucial to ensure peace building needs are met. We also must acknowledge and address the role of member states in the problem of fragmented funding. We appreciate our role in this. Siloing and competition are partly consequences of the incentives created by we member states. Donors can play their part, including by encouraging joint analysis and programming, pro, uh, programming across the UN as a fundamental part of fund, funding arrangements. Coming back to the culture of peace, I just want to focus quickly on two connected issues. Uh, that's the positive drivers of peace and the relationship between the SDGs. A point which the IPA, IPI has been very effective in making is that there are positive drivers of peace as well as drivers of conflict. We need to think about both how to minimize risks and impact of conflict and how to maximize the chances and dividends of peace. A second point related to coherence is that we need to see the ways that the SDGs intersect and relate in order to implement them effectively. This notion of positive drivers of peace is at the heart of the approach in the culture of peace. UNESCO's global initiative for building a culture of peace through education and youth empowerment, for example, goes directly to the issue of fostering positive peace. But these efforts also align with the principles which inform the 2030 Agenda. SDG 16 highlights that sustainable development, as well as being a goal in itself, also mitigates conflict risks and acts to reinforce positive incentives for peace. And SDG 4, Gender, highlights the need to ensure inclusive and equitable quality education. Sorry, education. A key part of achieving our ambitions in terms of prevention and sustaining peace is to find effective ways to implement the SDGs at the nexus points within SDG 16, which is where the positive drivers of peace often dwell. The fact that there's been 20 years of thinking and initiatives in at least some of these nexus points within the culture of peace stream means there's already a rich resource available. And conversely, the framework of the SDGs and the nexus points with six, SDG 16 can give new ideas for those working on the culture of peace on how to broaden its implementation. Let me just give one further example about positive drivers of peace and the nexus points with SDG 16, related again to actual initiatives pursued within the culture of peace stream, and that's to do with gender issues. Uh, women can play a critical role in preventing conflict and working towards sustainable peace. Re research has shown a strong relationship between the status of women in a society and the likelihood of war and conflict. Um, one fascinating statistic, gender equality appears to be a better indicator by far of a state's peacefulness than the strength of democracy or the level of GDP. So a, a really quite an interesting correlation. And that's yet another reason for obviously promoting greater inclusion of women. Further, where conflict does occur, women can play a key role in restoring stability. When women exercise real influence in the process of peace negotiations, the prospects for reaching agreement increases. 
Conversely, the chances of agreements being implemented grows and the likelihood of agreement failing diminishes. Recognising these connections, Australia is the first and largest donor to the Women's Peace and Humanitarian Fund, strengthening the capacity of women's organisations to participate in conflict prevention, crisis resolution and peace building. I should again acknowledge the very important work that the IPA has contributed in this area. And it's about how SDG 5 on gender equality intersects with SDG 16 on peaceful and inclusive societies. And it's another clear driver, example where the positive drivers of peace lie at the nexus of SDG 16 and other SDGs. It's another area also where UNESCO has established programming under the culture of peace strand of work as well, including regionally in the Asia Pacific. So efforts towards a culture of peace contribute, in our view, to the ambitions of the Sustaining Peace Agenda and the SDGs. They've already developed initiatives and thinking in some of the areas where implementation is needed. Conversely, Sustaining Peace and the SDGs themselves have provided powerful, fresh impetus for the ideas at the heart of the culture of peace. And I think we should keep working together on the potential for these agendas to inform and support each other. So thank you for the opportunity to contribute here today. Great, thank you. Uh, thank you for the the the, uh, the multiple uh, plugs for IPI's work. I really uh, appreciate that, and, I, and also for for doing the job of, of of making the connection that it is indeed interesting to reflect uh, back upon some of these ideas that have been developing since uh, uh, nineteen uh, since the late nineteen nineties. In part, thanks to uh, 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 member states like uh, Bangladesh. Um, but that now we are we are uh, gaining progress to, as the PGA said, to embed them in, in, in the system, and that's that's really important. Uh, in particular, I think around these these two ideas um, that you mentioned, UN coherence and predictable uh, financing, um, are, are central issues. And those actually were, uh, if I can make one more uh, mention of IPI's work, uh, central to uh, the recommendations in the Independent Commission on Multilateralism. Um, these are some things, these are of course not new, these are things that we've been aware of for quite some time, but um, uh, um, where we hope to make more progress on that now. And one thing I would just say, uh, in your important uh, point about gender issues, I think the, the, the principle of inclusivity is of course one of the key points that connects all these, all these agendas up. So thank you so, so very much. Um, I will now uh, pass the uh, um, floor to Ambassador uh, from Bangladesh. Please sir, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, I first of all would like to thank the International uh, Peace Institute and Al-Babtain uh, Foundation for organizing this uh, policy forum to discuss the potential linkages of a culture of peace uh, with the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development and the comprehensive notion of sustaining peace. As an ardent proponent of a culture of peace, uh, Bangladesh can only appreciate uh, this kind of constructive and uh, forward-looking initiatives. The culture of peace is a centerpiece of uh, Bangladesh's foreign policy. In his maiden and only statement at the UN General Assembly in 1974, our father of the nation, Bangabundu Sheikh Mujibur Rahman, had said, and I quote, peace is an imperative for the survival of mankind. It represents the deepest aspiration of men and women throughout the world. A peace must be based on justice. He added, our total commitment to peace is born of the realization that only an environment of peace would enable us to enjoy the fruits of our hard-won national independence and to mobilize and concentrate all our energies and resources in combating the scourges of poverty, hunger, disease, illiteracy, and unemployment. In our war-ravished country, deploying the minimal resources available to the purpose of nation building, our national leadership at that time did realize the resolution of war or conflicts would not be the sole guarantee for peace. In order for peace to be sustained, it would be critical to vigorously invest in positive drivers of peace and combat the socio-economic factors that tend to undermine peace. In the words I just quoted, we would see that the notions of sustainable development and sustaining peace were already germane to the vision of our political leadership. We do owe it to their legacy to deliver of the commitments we have collectively undertaken along the pathway they had chartered for us. The close resemblance between the eight pillars of a culture of peace 
and the 17 goals of the 2030 agenda is therefore no chance or mere coincidence. The eight pillars of a culture of peace are expected to complement each other in a symbiotic interface. Likewise, the mutually reinforcing goals of the 2030 agenda can also advance the cause of a culture of peace. There are a number of sustainable development goals that tend to have direct bearing upon the culture of peace, while a number of relevant targets across the agenda can have indirect yet meaningful impact on promoting a culture of peace. Moreover, another issue which is haunting us in recent times is violent extremism. And the declaration and the program of action on the culture of peace has been duly recognized as relevant within the context of implementing the global counterterrorism strategy. Culture of peace's relevance to combating terrorism and violent extremism can only strengthen our efforts to counter these scourges. It would therefore perhaps not be an overstatement to claim that the culture of peace be considered to be a cross-cutting agenda throughout the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. This approach would help serve two objectives. First, the culture of peace framework would help pave the way for further streamlining the discourses between peace and development that still tend to be, create some discomfort among certain quarters. Second, it would allow the entire UN system and the broader international community to embrace a culture of peace through the all-encompassing prism of sustainable development and not just the preserve of one or two designated UN entities. It is increasingly obvious that the culture of peace tends to remain captive to some artificial silos within the UN system, as was also uh, mentioned by my colleague uh, from Australia. This has perhaps been the unwitting consequence of the overwhelming and legitimate focus placed on promoting peace education, freedom of media, intercultural dialogue, and interfaith harmony as critical tools of promoting the culture of peace. In the process, we may have, however, lost focus on the much broader scope and aspiration of a culture of peace, which should also perhaps evolve in our collective thought process as we embrace a more holistic nation of peace itself. This enlargement of the aperture for viewing the culture of peace also creates the opportunity for its interface with the comprehensive notion of sustaining peace. The way we have defined sustaining peace as both a goal and a process can be applied in case of our understanding of a culture of peace. Peace is not just a goal in itself to ensure the absence of war, but is the key reference point in a continuum where sustained engagement and dialogue are required at all levels to reinforce the underlining drivers of peace as well as the enabling policies and institutions. If peace is part of a continuum, then the culture that aims to create defenses of peace in human hearts and minds should also be a continuous process. This year's focus in the high-level forum on early childhood development is therefore particularly relevant. One of the most effective ways to mainstream a culture of peace across societies is to instill the underlying values of tolerance, diversity, inclusivity, and pluralism among people in general, starting with young, impressionable minds. This is also an entry point for the culture of peace to effectively interface with sustaining peace towards promoting inclusivity in the context of national ownership, especially with the participation of those lagging the furthest behind. The sheer absence of such national ownership underpinned by inclusivity is manifest in many national contexts, both developed and developing, and not least in the grave situation unfolding in the Rakhine state in our neighboring Myanmar. It is perhaps no surprise that among the more than 123,000 fresh entrants into Bangladesh since last week, there is a significant number of women, children, and the elderly with humanitarian access to the UN and other civil society actors severely restricted. In the face of such political and humanitarian crisis, it only makes sense that the culture of peace provide the broader framework for the Secretary General's prevention agenda, as well as his peace and security architecture 
reform initiatives. We need to bring a fundamental shift in our practice to address in isolation the various notions related to international peace and security, even when the constituent elements of most of these notions share multiple commonalities and objectives. I believe my fellow speaker, the Assistant Secretary General of the Peacebuilding Support Office would tend to agree with me on this. As a member of the Peacebuilding Commission, I recognize our own responsibility in bringing the notion of culture of peace to also bear upon our deliberations on sustaining peace. In this context, my colleague, uh, uh, Ms. Bird, already mentioned the role of women, peace and security in the context of Security Council Resolution 1325. We must involve women, and I would add our youth, in all our efforts to promote a culture of peace in conflict situations, as well as peace building efforts. I wish to conclude with a point about measuring or assessing the operationalization of the culture of peace. Recently, I had spoken here at IPI about the opportunities and challenges of measuring peace, especially when sub subjective perceptions often play a critical role in case of such measurements. It would probably be an interesting point to discuss further if it would serve the culture of peace as a conceptual framework to be subject to such indicator-based measurements that may be relevant for the SDGs, especially SDG 16. I wish to thank you again for uh, this uh, stimulating discussion. Thank you. Great. Uh, thank you so much. And on your last point, any anytime someone from a panel calls for uh, uh, a discussion of measurement indicators, I take that as a, as a call for more research, which as a think tank, I really appreciate. It's a, a part of our, our mission. And um, I think you're absolutely right. And it's a part of the whole point of this, that, that the, uh, the close re resemblance between the eight pillars of the culture of peace and the 17 SDGs is not just mere coincidence. They're, mere, uh, they're mutually reinforcing. Um, and I think that it's, uh, it's it's incumbent upon all of us to think about the ways in which the uh, culture of peace can actually help to us to address these issues of UN coherence that we've been talking about. Um, one other thing, I, I really was struck by your, your comment about enlarging the aperture of how, of how we view the culture of peace. Uh, this is a really uh, interesting metaphor, especially when we think about key to all of this is the change in mindset, as the ambassador uh, uh, said, and, um, and thus the role of education, which I think is the, uh, the theme of uh, the panel this afternoon, is so, uh, so important. Uh, so thank you very much for your, for your leadership on this issue. Uh, we'll now turn to uh, um, Assistant Secretary General Bernardo Stranco. Thank you, Adam, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, first let me start by um, thanking the International Peace Institute and my good friend and longtime colleague, uh, Ambassador Terje Roy Larsen, um, as well as the Albatain Foundation and its director and founder, Mr. Abdulaziz Saud Albatain, for hosting what I think is a very pertinent, important discussion as the Secretary General is about to launch three very interrelated reforms that speak precisely to the interlinkages between the Sustainable Development Goals, Sustaining Peace, and the culture of peace. Uh, let me start maybe by also positioning this, this discussion in the current context where we have more than 1.4 billion people, including half of the world's extremely poor people, living in fragile and conflict-affected settings. And the predictions are that this number will be growing by 82% by the time that the 2030 agenda comes to its uh, time, uh, you know, uh, conclusions. While the importance of sustaining peace is a lived reality for millions of people, so too is the imperative of sustainable development. And sustainable development is essential to sustaining peace and vice versa. And I think all the documents are consistently referring to this interlinkage. This understanding is also very well captured in the 1999 Declaration and Program of Action on a culture of peace and in its eight pillars. In April of last year, the Security Council and the General Assembly again adopted these very groundbreaking resolutions on sustaining peace. And here, a special tribute and thanks to Ambassador um, Gideon Bird, who played a, a, a key role, a fundamental role as co-facilitator to getting such a groundbreaking statement on what the role of the UN should be in peace building and prevention. 
And while peace building had come to be narrowly interpreted as a time-bound, exogenous interventions that take place after the guns fall silent, mm. sustaining peace seeks to reclaim peace in its own right. This is very similar to the concept of the culture of peace and its emphasis on a positive, dynamic, participatory process. The resolutions place sustaining peace at the core of UN actions before, during, and after violent conflicts. This is a fundamental redefinition of the context, which is, I think, going to be hugely important in the conceptualization of the reform efforts going forward. The Secretary General, as you all know, has similarly identified prevention as, as his number one priority and articulated his vision for a strongly integrated approach across the UN. Like our founding charter, this connects our efforts for peace and security, sustainable development, human rights, and humanitarian action. Sustainable Development Goal 16 calls, again, as has been stated, for the promotion and maintenance of peaceful and inclusive societies. However, interlinkages with peace are not just limited to SDG 16. Rather, they reflect across sustaining peace and throughout the 2030 Agenda. Let me concentrate my remarks on three critical points on the bonds between sustaining peace, sustainable development, and advancing the culture of peace. The first is that sustainable development, sustaining peace, and the culture of peace prioritize inclusivity. Sustaining peace means putting member states and their populations in the lead through inclusive national ownership, as Ambassador Monen has stated. The sustained peace resolutions emphasis on the 2030 Agenda's commitment to an inclusive and people-centered approach, and the endeavor to reach the furthest behind first is fundamental. Political exclusion, for example, is the single most important factor in the breakdown of peace agreements and many times of violent conflict. Inclusion means a focus on people-driven solutions. Sustaining peace also underscores the vital and positive role of young women and men in peace building. In Bosnia and Herzegovina, for example, the Secretary General's Peace Building Fund has been supporting youth to find their voice through an intercultural dialogue platform to discuss peace building priorities. The initiative has reached more than 30% of the population and has reduced youth dissatisfaction and supported the intercultural education that has been so much referred to here today. The second point is that a culture of peace, sustaining peace and sustainable development mean nurturing partnerships the Sustaining Peace and 2030 Agenda recognize the value of working better with local actors and building stronger partnerships beyond the United Nations. In Papua New Guinea, for example, the Peace Building Fund has supported community-level discussions to ensure that the people's voices are heard in the pre-referendum period. In Libya, we are currently working with national and local authorities, civil society, and many others to promote, again, an inclusive national reconciliation plan, including through grassroots initiative, the bottom-up approach, which I think is uh, referred to in the concept note to this meeting. And then again, sustaining peace means working with civil society, the private sector, regional, sub-regional organizations, and the international financial institutions and beyond. And finally, again, maybe to highlight that there exists a critical platform for building a culture of peace. The Peace Building Commission holds a unique place as a dedicated intergovernmental advisory body for international peace building efforts. And here I would like to second Ambassador Mone's uh, suggestion that more be done within the framework of the Peace Building Commission to bring these discussions of the culture of peace. The, rec the resolutions call for strengthening the role of the Peace Building Commission, its convening and bridging role, and its partnership with other stakeholders. In Burundi, for example, the Commission, the Peace Building Commission, has engaged with the government and national stakeholders, encouraging peaceful solutions by Burundians with regional and international support, including the African Union, East African community, and neighboring countries. And moving beyond the country's specific configuration, this new way of working, if you will. The Peace Building Commission has also supported countries like Burkina Faso, Kyrgyzstan, Somalia, and several countries in the Sahel. 
The Peace Building Commission is an advocate for advancing the culture of peace, linking prevention to national and regional ownership and bringing together a broad collection of stakeholders, including in support of sustainable development. The resolutions, as Ambassador Byrne has said, on sustaining peace do ask the Secretary General to include in a report that will be presented in the 72nd session of the General Assembly his efforts in implementing the sustaining peace resolution. And then this is a significant opportunity to present concrete, bold, and ambitious ideas, some of which have been reflected here today. The Secretary General's prevention platform will be central to this work. So in concluding, again, peace is not simply a benchmark to achieve. It requires ongoing dynamic participation from the entire society and partners. Advancing a culture of peace is critical. The role of the UN is to support our member states to provide experience, expertise, and the forum a platform. Sustainable development and peace must go hand in hand. Thank you very much. Great, thank you, thank you uh, so much, Oscar, for putting that into the, into the context of the, of the Secretariat's uh, work, and also uh, need uh, with the reminder that this is about uh, at least uh, 1.4 billion people living in fragile settings around the world. It's not just a conversation that we're having here in New York, of course. Um, and uh, the, the need or the, the recognition that inclusivity, again, is the key, key factor in the SDG sustaining peace and the culture of peace. Um, and of course, the importance of the PBC. I think uh, the work of, of IPI uh, um, uh, is very much committed, committed to supporting that as well. So uh, uh, thank you. And we look forward to working with you continually. Um, we've got uh, a good uh, 20 minutes for, for discussion. Um, and so I will um, open uh, the floor for your uh, questions. Don't be shy. A lot on the table. <laughs> the culture of silence. Okay. Um, oh, yeah. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, Pat Mancino with the National Council on United States Arab Relations in Washington. Um, can you briefly describe um, the Trump administration's reaction uh, or in uh, non-reaction or res response to uh, your your peace initiatives, and can you describe the the kind of feedback uh, or sense that that you're getting from the new administration on how they're going to play such a role in uh, in in uh, in meeting your uh, your objectives? Thank you. Great. Uh, I'll also add one. Oh, I'll also add one to the one to the table. Um, we talked, we talked a, a, a bit just now um, uh, about the uh, connections amongst the three uh, agendas, the need for a change in mindset. And I was wondering if uh, perhaps um, uh, the ambassador uh, from Bangladesh or others could tell you a little, a little bit more about the work um, that's particular to uh, early childhood education that I know is an important part of the, this, this, uh, this, um, the high-level forum today, as I know it's a special theme, um, and I know it's one that is also uh, important to our partners here at the al uh Foundation. Um, any questions? No. Anyone want to touch the, uh, the Trump question? <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> <laughs> Ambassador, would you like to? Uh, Oh, Hi, okay, my name is ago. Kristen. I'm with Air Quality Asia. How do you envision the UN motivating civil society and NGOs and IGOs specifically to help implement the SDGs considering funding shortages and other internal issues? And, uh, I think there was one more here. Did, Aaron, did you have a, was that, was there one more at the, or in front of you? No, okay. No, okay. Uh, You did have a question. No, sorry. <laughs> You're sorry, in front of. Uh... Thank you, panel. I'd like to, uh, Leslie Wilkinson, former senior political officer at the UN, 
Um, I'd be very interested to know what the panel think is the most important issue to bring about or to engender a culture of peace. I know Ambassador Bird mentioned the question of women, education, all of you have. I wonder if you could tell me what is the paramount issue that you think should be pushed in this matter. Thank you. Great, I think we'll come back to the panel uh, right now for education, financing, and maybe Trump. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, uh, well, uh, the question that you posed and, and the last question, they have a certain uh, sort of linkage. Um, we, we believe that uh, the role of the family is of crucial importance because it is in the families uh, before uh, children uh, go to school and uh, are exposed to uh, formal uh, curricula where, of course, we should also strive to have uh, culture of peace uh, uh, topics uh, for uh, children to learn. Uh, but before that, in the families, when uh, in the early childhood, uh, either uh, parents, like uh, mostly mothers perhaps, uh, and also uh, in, in the behavior uh, pattern of the children uh, uh, with their siblings or with uh, the you know, other family members, if we can inculcate uh, uh, certain behavioral uh, sort of uh, changes, uh, uh, for example, uh, you know, the values of uh, sharing, uh, values of uh, tolerance, uh, you know, uh, giving some kind of rewards for good behavior, uh, things like that, uh, I think, uh, can uh, go a long way in terms of uh, creating a better generation uh, where uh, people uh, grow up uh, in, in some sort of uh, more tolerant uh, fashion. Uh, what we uh, should not be teaching our children is that uh, the differences uh, or highlighting the differences uh, of peoples uh, in terms of their you know, attitudes, uh, uh, you know, that, uh, that people uh, believing in other religions, they're not good, or you know, neighbors uh, uh, who are of different faith or different color or different uh, sectarian uh, sort of uh, background. So these are the things children learn uh, at very early stage. So uh, I, I would say that uh, you know, uh, if we really focus on that, uh, then, uh, and, and subsequently, of course, uh, in, in the uh, primary education or, or secondary uh, education, a more age-appropriate uh, uh, curricula can be also introduced. So that could be uh, one strategy. And I think in today's uh, afternoon session, uh, the panelists will uh, will uh, concentrate on how uh, these early childhood uh, uh, education uh, strategies can be uh, actually uh, implemented. Uh, coming back to the question of uh, how the UN motivating the NGOs, INGOs, in terms of uh, uh, funding or uh, financing of the SDGs. Uh, I, I believe uh, this is already happening. And as uh, the Official Development Assistance uh, or ODA uh, and other official sources are dwindling, uh, the UN and also uh, many of the uh, developing countries uh, are actually looking uh, for uh, funding uh, from private sector sources, uh, from philanthropies. These are also uh, included in the SDG itself. So now uh, more and more of these kind of leveraging activities are taking place. And uh, I uh, was here uh, <clears throat> in the early uh, 90s in the UN. And at that time, I, I hardly could uh, see uh, participation of NGOs and INGOs uh, in regular meetings of the, of the UN. But nowadays, we see, uh, as we have seen uh, during the HLPF and also during the forthcoming uh, GA, that hundreds of uh, events are being organized. And, lot of interest are being generated uh, within the NGO sectors and INGOs and also the private sector to get involved with the UN. And at the same time, there's a huge receptivity amongst the member states to also welcome uh, this uh, interest. So I think uh, this is a kind of a win-win situation and, uh, and uh, more and more of these are likely to happen. And uh, I'm hopeful that uh, the private sector uh, would be a good uh, complementary sort of source of uh, financing of uh, SDGs. And the last question, which was actually asked at first, how uh, do we view the Trump administration's uh, uh, take on all these? Uh, I believe uh, President Trump is uh, organizing uh, an event on the 18th morning uh, where uh, he will personally address uh, how the UN uh, reform is going on 
the reform agenda. And in that agenda, of course, uh, uh, the peace uh, security architecture uh, also uh, figures prominently. So uh, we will hear firsthand from him uh, how he views uh, the UN should uh, act in terms of uh, nurturing this uh, uh, peace initiative or sustaining peace. Thank you. Great. Uh, thank you. If I can actually uh, dovetail to that and add to the to the question that, that um, I mean, because in, in part I think in the in the UN system, part of the effect of the of uh, um, the current U.S. administration's uh, stance of the UN is related to the call and the need for pre more predictable financing. Um, we're in an era where uh, um, we need to do uh, more with less, uh, but also that there is. Uh, greater greater demand, so there is actually a growing um, funds, but also more more need, um, and so I'm just curious if if um, ambassador, if you have you mentioned the World Bank, um, we're all looking at the private sector, but what are the ways that we can improve within the house as well um, uh, to to help uh, make financing uh, more predictable and sustainable? Thank you. Happy to comment on that and some of the questions. I mean, on the financing, I think it's, the UN has a central role, but it can't do it all itself. It, 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 what the UN is good at doing is convening, pulling people together, it, and it's that role and leveraging the UN's unique authority as the, as the global body that is really critical. So engaging with, I mentioned the World Bank, um, regional banks, but also the private sector and, the, and civil society. Um, that's what the UN really has to get better at doing. It's those partnerships which are going to be increasingly important going forward. There's a lot of money out there in other areas and it's how the UN can best access and, and leverage that I think is going to be critical. Having said that, I do think there also needs to be more predictable, as I said, financing, particularly for sustaining peace. The way the UN is structured, there is an inbuilt uh, structural and financial uh, bias towards peacekeeping rather than sustaining peace. It just goes back to the history and the way it was set up. So a peacekeeping operation is easy to fund. There's a special mechanism. It's, 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 it's done. And the funds that go to peacekeeping vastly outweighs the, the money spent on the rest of the UN system. And sustaining peace has been a bit of an orphan and a poor cousin in this. So getting that shift, um, it's, it's going to be challenging. But unless the opportunity is taken of the request that's been made to the Secretary General to come forward with ambitious, bold and new proposals on this. I fear we will just, incremental shifts won't do it. There does need to be really quite a significant shift on that, um, on that funding issue, which I recognise it's not easy and it will involve member states also changing the way they approach these issues. But I do think it's fundamental. But as I also said, the UN shouldn't think it it, it needs to do everything itself. It needs to work really well with other actors, particularly those with resources, uh, in a cohesive way. Um, just a couple of the other points. What's the most important issue for cultural peace? I mean, it's really hard to just say there's one issue, and that's partly, I think, came through all of the presentations. It is such an interrelated um, fit. It is, it, and everything reinforces everything else. I know there's a risk with that. When it's everything, is it sort of nothing? How do you how do you make sure that, the, that things are taken forward? And this is where I come back again to another aspect of the UN role which can and should be improved, and the UN wants to do this, and that is the coherence. Uh, it, the, the, the way that the UN has developed over time, the way we member states have funded it, has led to, and it's a term I hate because we keep using it, silos, but you've got a very disjuncted system that doesn't work very well together and is actually quite competitive. So moving away from that to one where everyone actually does work together, it's a real challenge, but it's one the new Secretary General, who's incredibly impressive, has embraced. Um, and we really, it brings us back to the reform question that was asked. Um, delivering on his three big reform agendas, the peace and security, the development and the management reform, is going to be absolutely critical. And they are interrelated. And in my mind, the management reform is one of the most important of the three. People, people's eyes tend to glaze when you talk management. But unless that management reform part is, is effectively dealt with, 
um, it really will be very difficult to deliver on the other pillars. Now, management reform is not an end in itself. It's a means to an end, but that is important on delivering on the peace and security and on the development side. So there's a lot riding on that. And we're all looking forward to the event that um, was referred to that, that President Trump is hosting, which is on UN reform writ large. Um, that will be very interesting. And I think UN reform will be a theme for a lot of, a lot of the leaders coming here um, uh, next week or the week after next. Uh, finally, on civil society, I couldn't agree more. It's important to involve civil society uh, in the UN generally, not just in SDGs. Australia is a very strong supporter of civil society participation. Um, it's not, not a position that's necessarily universally shared, but we'll continue to work hard to ensure we can get civil society access uh, to the ex as much as we can. Ambassador Moman also mentioned the private sector, again, coming back to financing and the rest. Their involvement in the SDGs is also extremely important. Uh, what we've noticed in Australia, and I'm sure we'll see it more generally, is the SDGs have provided a platform for all of those actors to mobilise nationally uh, and to work with government in a way that perhaps hasn't happened in the past. We're doing our voluntary national review on the SDGs next year and already we're starting to see um, really good collaboration between government, civil society and the private sector on what is, what, ha what is it that we've done, what have we achieved, what are the challenges going forward. So I think it's as much nationally as here at the UN that the SDGs can help drive that civil sector participation. It's hard to add to a lot of what has already been said, but I do think, I mean, some of the challenges going forward is, is precisely how uh, we arrive at addressing this issue of fragmentation, not just within the UN, but among member states. I mean, the change of the mindset is a two-way street, a change of mindset in member states, uh, within the different committees that do tend to focus and work very much in silos, and change of the mindset and uh, spanning across the different aspects of the work of the UN um, equally within. So, this, so this, it, is, it is a cultural change. This is uh, the reform aspects will not just be about the architectural aspects of organigrams and boxes and what moves and which posts come and go. I would say that the most important part always is the cultural dimension of how we work differently. Uh, so what applies to the UN applies to the membership. Uh, how the Peace Building Commission is able to articulate this advisory bridging role between the General Assembly, ECOSOC, and the Security Council is fundamental to this issue about prevention. Uh, where this discussion happens has to be an integrative one, and this is why the linkage between the Sustainable Development Goals and the Sustaining Peace Resolution is so critical. This nexus between peace and security, development, human rights, and the interlinkages with humanitarian response are all fundamental. Uh, the people who receive and require and expect the support of the United Nations don't ask if they're coming from this, this, or that part of the UN. Uh, the, the, the UN has one flag, and it's everybody's flag, and that's what people see and expect, the billions of people with which we are intensely engaged. So I think that these reforms actually will speak to that issue, and it is why this report of the Secretary General on sustaining peace will be the last report, actually, that comes out. And there will be a specific, in, uh, uh, how can I say, a decision, an intention, to explain how these reforms come together on the issue of prevention, right? Which is the first sentence of the Charter of the UN. This is what the UN was, is to prevent, to prevent conflict from happening, war from happening in the first place. So. I would say that um, a lot rides in the way we work together, and, there, and things have been happening. And I think, uh, thanks to the uh, prodding and the, and the support of member states, since the resolution was passed, there has been already quite a significant shift in the way things are happening in the Secretariat. And just as a very recent example that will soon be discussed next week in the Peace Building Commission, the whole aspect on how we're dealing with the transition, say, in a country like Liberia, how we are working across the UN to ensure that the transition from the peacekeeping operation to the national government, its citizens, and the UN configuration actually speaks to this issue of continuity and building on the SDGs as the central part of, of the response. Um, on the issue of civil society, I think this is crucial. Uh, the Peace Building Fund 
has changed its working modalities, again, as a result of the request of these resolutions. Uh, for the first time, we have the Secretary General's Peace Building Fund that can actually fund directly uh, NGOs um, according to a certain amount of criteria. And I would say this is extremely important because reaching the furthest behind many times in many countries requires a very close partnership between government, civil society, with the people actually working on the ground in very remote areas. Uh, not all UN agencies have a presence. And again, uh, we have launched very competitive calls for proposals that actually seek to empower women and support youth's participation in society. And uh, we have increasingly gotten a tremendous response from civil society. And it has been an energizing process because it actually has been a wake-up call for many UN agencies who see their proposals many times not as good as those coming from civil society, particularly as it relates to empowering women and working with youth. This is the only fund in the UN that has attained a 20% target of supporting women's mm -hmm. empowerment programs. Um, so, and then maybe just um, you know, the last point on predictable financing. I think this is hugely important. Um, it's, the, um, it's the ability to respond quickly, to take risks, to be flexible, to be fast, responsive requires a different type of financing that actually articulates and builds on the SDGs and sustaining peace resolutions. And here, the proposals we hope will be bold. Um, it is expected that the member states will be equally as bold in their response because um, we are in this impasse between voluntary contributions, assessed contributions, special trust funds, and many times the inability of the UN to move fast is very much linked to the conditions posed on the different streams of financing. So financing is very much at the heart of the reform itself. The prevention platform would be one way of addressing this. The coherence, the coordination, the integration within the different streams, the empowerment of the UN leadership on the ground to be able to move and take decisions that support peace building priorities of the governments and peoples that we are here to serve actually translate into, into action, and we end up preventing conflict. The last point, so sort of an infomercial, because we will be, uh, during the high-level week, launching what has been a unique, a first joint study between the United Nations and the World Bank on the link between development policies and prevention of violent conflict. This is a seminal uh, research work that has involved many, many consultations, many partners, and it is basically, I think, for the first time, we have the business case being built on why prevention works, how it saves lives, how it saves costs, how it actually empowers and emboldens and allows uh, actually inclusive and stable societies to, 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 to be built. So a very important piece of work that will actually enable the financial instruments of the World Bank with the financial instruments of the UN to start working together in a smarter, more strategic way. Thank you. Great, thanks. Uh, we need to wrap up. We'll wrap up if you uh, don't mind. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Aaron McCandless from the New School, where I also uh, direct a project on re forging resilient social contracts. And I'm very interested in this question, or the, the, the topic of uh, positive drivers of peace. And of course, it's not a new one. We've been talking about um, peace and conflict sensitivity um, for a very long time, which is a similar concept. So my question is about really how you see operationalizing this, both within the peace building architecture and more widely. You know, will it be through peace and conflict type assessments or resilience assessments at well, as well that can inform programming and policy? Um, will it be by actually funding drivers of peace? I mean, again, of course, this has to be very nationally determined. And in, for example, within the New Deal process, where I'm very involved, um, we are also looking at, we're revising the fragility assessments that we do to be resilience and fragility assessments, you know, with that precise focus to be able to help facilitate prioritization and planning and political decision making around how to address, you know, key issues to support peace building and state building. So look forward to hearing from you. Great, thank you. We'll take one more question here, um, back, and then uh, we'll wrap up. Thank you. Abdul Aziz, coming from Fordham University and at the Administration for Children's Services. 
Um, my question is uh, regarding Myanmar or Burma, if I may refer to the previous name or the old name. What is the panel's view on the conflict, or if I may refer to it as genocide happening in Myanmar, and what is the international community doing so far? Great, thank you. Well, now uh, we'll come back to the panel one, uh, one more time, and, uh, um, and then we'll wrap up. Ambassador. Uh, thank you. <clears throat> uh, on the first question, uh, I would uh, emphasize on, uh, uh, you know, investment on education and also building institutions and partnerships. So these are the, you know, operational arms, I think, uh, to uh, have this uh, culture of peace uh, across the board. Uh, and on the question of uh, Myanmar, uh, I think uh, the Secretary General has issued uh, several uh, statements in the last week or so, and uh, he has also written a letter to the Security Council uh, for its membership to uh, take action uh, to arrest uh, the immediate violence there uh, so that uh, this huge uh, uh, humanitarian uh, crisis of overflowing uh, refugees uh, in, into Bangladesh is immediately stopped and uh, steps are being taken for their uh, early uh, repatriation. Thank you. Ambassador Brittany. Thank you very much. Um, just on the couple of comments, just adding on what was just being said, um, uh, the SG has, as you said, been involved and put out some statements. Um, uh, one thing that might be worth noting is Kofi Annan uh, led an advisory committee on Rakhine State, which made some very good recommendations. It was good to see Kofi Annan uh, playing that role, so that's, that's, that report is also um, out there. Um, just on this, the positive drivers of peace um, and how can we take that forward? What does it actually mean in practice? I mean, just, just a couple of points on that. I think, and I mentioned it in my intervention, and it does go back to this, the coherence issue we keep talking about and working together. But if you take sustaining peace, and I think you said it, Ambassador Mohan, it's, it's not just a goal, it's, it's, a, it's not just a process, not just a goal, it's also a process. It's this idea of a continuum. So sustaining peace has to underpin everything the UN is doing. You, therefore, this issue of the UN coming together and having joint analysis, joint planning, rather than looking at a situation as quite distinct and separate stages, you know, pre-conflict, conflict and post-conflict, as if they're completely separate and different and you have an entirely different solution to each. It's trying to make it that as a, as a, a seamless process throughout. Um, and again, that's easier said than done. But it's precisely because they're being treated as separate issues, you've got these disjuncts and that's when you have real problems. So relapse uh, to conflict has been greater than it should be because the, we've not been very good at managing that that transition, particularly from end of conflict uh, through to rebuilding a resilient society. So it's, it does, does keep going back to that coherence um, and working, working as one, um, which is the UN, UN mantra. So it, it, it's, again, not a simple answer, but the more that that's done, the better we're going to be at, at avoiding the kind of um, disjuncted approach we have at the moment. We're running out of time, yeah. but just uh, important, I think, is this notion that um, a lot of the assessment tools that do exist within the UN, within the World Bank, within the Africa Development Bank, within the European Union, and you can add as many bilaterals as you would want to that equation, is this notion that the coherence in terms of assessments instruments and, and, and what comes out of that is extremely important, that we do align behind uh, national priorities that we're able to build on the on, the, on an analysis of root causes of these conflicts. Uh, that, is, that does require a certain skill that spans across the UN, humanitarian development, peace and, secure, peace and peace building actors have a lot of expertise in this. But again, the issue of alignment, the issue of prioritization, and the issue of a peace building strategy, this is about uh, building resilience, building reconciliation where this needs to happen, or strengthening the institutions so that they are inclusive. And, Last but not least, addressing grievances, the issue of exclusion, marginalization, discrimination, 
the non-working of institutions or the lack of presence of institutions is, is many times the drivers of the type of conflicts that we want to see prevented. So being able to ascertain that and build the capacities, the national capacities to address these issues nationally and sub-regionally is I think the big challenge. So the partnerships becomes fundamental. The UN doing this alone won't do it or either any, or any of the other institutions. So again, building on common methodologies and then leveraging the different instruments in support of an inclusive nationally owned process I think is fundamental for the sustainability and in order to allow this predictability and continuity of support of these processes. That's what I think is the challenge going forward. Great, thank you. You know, I think one of the lessons I take of this is that, as, as I think has been said, I mean, there's been a lot of progress made, but the lion's share of work lies ahead. And I think also just the uh, the next few months towards the end of the year are really going to be critical in this process. And um, we really uh, wait with bated breath to see what comes out of the reform processes. And uh, um, we know that your participation, everyone here on the panel, is going to be critical to moving this process forward. So thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, and thank you all for, for coming. <laughs>